Part 1 You will hear a new student, Tom, talking to a student representative called Rachel about university clubs. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 4. Hi, welcome to Freshers Week. I'm Rachel. Can I help you? Oh, hi. Yes, um, I was hoping to find out about some clubs I could join. Well, all the club stands are here in this hall. What were you interested in? Um, not sure. <laughs> I wanted to do something where I could meet people. Well, take this leaflet with details of all the clubs and see what you think. Oh. It'll probably depend on what day you're free. Like on Mondays, there's the film club. Then on Tuesdays, you've got the climbing club. That's really good. I'm in that. <laughs> <laughs> then on Wednesdays, you've got chess, if you want something a bit more intellectual. But you should look through carefully because all the clubs run extra activities as well as their normal meetings. Oh, yes, I see. So, it looks like the film club has discussions after the films. I'd quite like to go to those. Then, climbing. <laughs> Goodness. It says here that the university has its own climbing wall. That's impressive. And they go on weekend trips. Mm. Cool. And it says the chess club normally just does games with whoever turns up. But it also runs competitions sometimes but I bet you've got to be pretty good to do that. Yes, I think so. And how many people are in the clubs? Are they all really full? Well, obviously they're all different. So, for example, the film club has just increased its membership from 85 to 125, but I think they're hoping to extend it to 150. The climbing club's quite small, 40 people. And the chess club is fairly healthy at 55. Right. OK. So who do I see if I want to join these clubs? Well, if you go round the stands and speak to the people there. For the film club, that's the events organiser. Um, for climbing, you'll need the club secretary. And the chess club is organised by one of the maths tutors. OK? Yep. <laughs> I think I'll start with the climbing club. It sounds good. Oh, well, as I said, I'm in that, so I might be able to help you a bit. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 5 to 10. OK. It says in the leaflet that they get together twice a month. Is that right? Yes. Oh, you must join. It's really good fun. <laughs> we go away quite a bit to North Wales, and every year we have a special excursion, usually to France, which is where we're going this year in the spring. The weather's too unpredictable in the autumn. Wow. That sounds good. But it must cost a lot. Yeah, but we try and save up for it through subscriptions. So rather than having a huge sum to pay in the month we go, we collect those weekly, so it spreads it out. Good idea. I think I'll definitely join. There are quite good benefits you get from joining. I mean, you need that, don't you? And the university clubs normally try and do deals with local businesses. So it's really worth joining. Like in the climbing club, they've got a special arrangement with one of the shops in town. So if you show your card, you can get money off equipment. Don't think the discount extends to clothes, though. That's really worth it, then.
I'll go over and talk to them now. OK. Hope you do join. <laughs> oh, and another thing I meant to say. If you do become a member, you automatically receive a magazine once a year. It's quite useful and interesting because it goes out to all the national climbing clubs. And the other thing is, if you come to every session, then you can get a complimentary ticket to the big exhibition that's held in Cardiff every year. So, hope to see you. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for your help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear someone talking to a group of university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Upton University. I hope you are settling in and beginning to find your way around. I know how confusing it can be when you start life at university, and that's why we have Freshers' Week to help you find your feet. Before I go any further, I should perhaps introduce myself. My name is Sally Jackson, and I am the secretary of the Students' Union, which has organized this week of events for you. You will usually find me in the office on the first floor of this building when I'm not attending lectures. Anyway, down to business. Of course, there are a few things that you are obliged to get done during your first week here, but once you've opened a bank account, if you haven't got one already, senior director of studies to discuss which courses you are going to take and signed up with a doctor, there will be plenty of time left to enjoy the events we have arranged for the week. And have we got a lot lined up for you. Throughout the week from Monday to Friday, Every morning, starting at 10 a.m., there will be orientation and welfare events. These will include tours of the campus, which, as you have probably noticed, is the size of a small town with 9,000 residential students, as well as sessions on developing study skills. We also have tours of Upton itself arranged for you, with a bus leaving from outside this building every afternoon at 5 o'clock. There are a number of interesting things to do and see in and around Upton, so you can expect visits to the castle and museum, as well as the popular Ghost Walk. You'll need to sign up for this one, as numbers are limited. Just put your name on the list on the notice board in the entrance lobby. An important event is scheduled for Monday, that's the day after tomorrow, when we will be holding the academic fair. This is an opportunity for you to speak to students and academic staff about the courses that are on offer. The academic fair starts at 1 o'clock, by the way. There are a couple of other fairs that I think will interest you. First of all, we have the Society's Fair on Tuesday the 16th, which I think is an absolute must. You might not believe it, but the university has over 150 societies and sports clubs you can sign up for, so you are sure to find something of interest to you. That also starts at 1 o'clock, and it will be here in the Union Building. 
Also in this building is the trade fair on Wednesday from 2 until 5 in the afternoon. This one might sound a bit strange because you will find a load of banks and other businesses here trying to get your custom. You will find plenty of bargains and, best of all, a lot of the businesses give away stuff for free. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. We've also got a great entertainment program lined up for you, starting tonight with our welcoming party. We have a top band lined up for your entertainment, but I'm not allowed to say who they are. All I can say is that I am sure you will not be disappointed. So come along to Blackmore Hall at 9 o'clock this evening to get your university experience off to a flying start. Just one point. I'm afraid this event is limited to freshers only. Because of space restrictions, you can't bring a friend tonight. Sorry about that. There's more fun and games on Monday in the Cotswold Theater here on campus. We have booked two of the cleverest comedians in the country, Paul Frazier and Jenny Brown, for a three-hour show. Paul has assured us that he and Jenny have packed the show with new material, and as they always get rave reviews for their shows, I think we can look forward to an evening of great entertainment. That's in the Cotswold Theater on Monday evening at 7.30. Moving along a bit, on Thursday, there is an important date for your diaries. This is the official Freshers Opening Ceremony, when the Dean welcomes you to Upton University. So remember, Thursday the 18th from 2.30 to 3.30 in Blackmore Hall. You certainly should go to this one, and by the way, light refreshments will be available. At the end of the week, on Saturday, you have the chance to dress up in your smartest evening wear for the official Freshers' Ball. Actually, although it's called a ball, it is quite a relaxed affair, so we are more than happy if you turn up wearing jeans and a t-shirt. The important thing is to relax and enjoy yourselves. Time and place are the same as for this evening's party. Blackmore Hall from 9 in the evening to 3 o'clock in the morning. Right. I think I've covered the most important and exciting events we have lined up for you, but there will be plenty of other things going on throughout the week, so remember to check the notice board in the entrance lobby regularly. Enjoy the rest of the day, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible this evening at the welcoming party. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. And you'll hear an introduction about the process of producing stamps. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Tell Me More, the programme where you ask the questions and we provide the answers. And we've had a wide variety of questions from you this week. And the subject we've picked for you this week, in response to your many letters, is the production of postage stamps. And as usual, we've been doing our homework on the subject. So, who designs the postage stamps that we stick on our letters? Well, in Australia, the design of postage is in the hands of Australia Post. In Britain, it's the Royal Mail that looks after stamps, and it seems that both countries have a similar approach to the production process. We discovered, to our surprise, that it can take up to two years to produce a new postage stamp. Why is that, I hear you ask? Surprisingly, it can't be all that difficult to design a stamp. In fact, it isn't, but it seems it's a lengthy business. Firstly, they have to choose the subjects, and this is done with the help of market research. Members of the general public, including families, are surveyed to find out what sorts of things they would like to see on their stamps. They are given a list of possible topics and asked to rank them. A list is then presented to the advisory committee, which meets about once a month. The committee is made up of outside designers, graphic artists and stamp collectors. If the committee likes the list, it sends it up to the board of directors, which makes the final decision. Then they commission an artist. In Australia, artists are paid $1,500 for a stamp design and a further $800 if the committee actually decides to use the design. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So there's a possibility that a stamp might be designed, but still never actually go into circulation. So what kind of topics are acceptable? Well, the most important thing is that they must be of national interest. And because a stamp needs to represent the country in some way, characters from books are popular, or you often find national animals and birds. So, of course, the kangaroo is a favourite in Australia. With the notable exception of members of the British royal family stamps, no living people ever appear on Australian or British stamps. Every year, the Royal Mail in Britain receives about 2,000 ideas for stamps, but very few of them are ever used. One favourite topic is kings and queens, for instance, King Henry VIII famous for his six wives, has recently appeared on a British stamp together with a stamp featuring each of his wives. But despite the extensive research which is done before a stamp is produced, it seems it's hard to please everybody. And apparently all sorts of people write to the post office to say that they loved or hated a particular series. The stamp to cause the most concern ever in Australia was a picture of Father Christmas surfing at the beach. And when you consider that the practical function of a stamp is only as a receipt for postage, I think perhaps the importance accorded to stamps has got out of all proportion. Well, that's all for today. If there's a subject you want us to tell you more about, drop us a line at... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. 
You are going to hear a talk on Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning and welcome to this talk on Canada. Many people think of Canada as a land of ice and snow. They think of it as a young country with few inhabitants, a country of English-speaking white people. While some of this is true, it is also an inaccurate description of the country we call Canada. Canada lies in the northern half of the continent of North America. The most northern parts of Canada are sometimes called the land of the midnight sun because at certain times of the year the sun never sets and is still shining faintly at midnight. This northern part of Canada is cold and mostly snow-covered all year round. Most of the people who live in this northern part of Canada are called Inuit or Dene. They were once called Eskimos. They are the original people of this land and are part of what are called the First Nation. As we move to the more southern parts of Canada, the land changes and so does the people. Moving from east to west in southern Canada, we travel from the Atlantic provinces of Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island. These small provinces with small populations border on the Atlantic Ocean. The land in these provinces is not very fertile, so fishing, forestry and mining are the main industries, although in some small areas agriculture is also important. If we travel west from the Atlantic provinces, we come to central Canada, composed of the large provinces of Quebec and Ontario. Both provinces are rich in natural resources, have fertile land and are the centres of industry for Canada's largest cities. Toronto and Montreal are found in these provinces. The province of Quebec is the centre of French language and culture in Canada. In fact, Montreal is the second largest French-speaking city in the world after Paris. Finally, in the far west of Canada, we come to the province of British Columbia. This province is separated from the prairies by the Rocky Mountains and is bounded on the west by the Pacific Ocean. British Columbia is often called simply the West Coast. British Columbia is an attractive place for tourists because of its mild climate, spectacular mountains, sea coast and beautiful forests. Agriculture, forestry, Shipping and fishing are major industries in British Columbia. The people of this land of Canada are as varied as its landscape. The original settlers, those we call the people of the First Nations, came from Asia by crossing the Bering Strait from Siberia to Alaska. In their new environment, they developed many new languages and cultures. In the 16th century, the first Europeans arrived in eastern Canada. They came from Britain and France. By making treaties with the original inhabitants, they gradually established colonies in eastern and central Canada. After a war with France, Britain took over the French colonies in Quebec and eastern Canada. By the end of the 18th century, all of Canada was under British rule. From this time until the present century, most of the immigrants to Canada were British, Scottish and Irish. In this century, however, Canada has had an influence of settlers from all over the world. There are now hundreds of thousands of people from Asia, Africa and South America who now call Canada their home. That is the end of part four. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. 